Okay, so I think that's everyone in the in the room today. Um, so welcome. Uh, thank you very much for first off joining us this morning. This is our second of the webinar series that we're putting together between Huddle, the University of Worcester and University of Derby. So following on from last uh, the, the session a couple of weeks ago, we're looking to um, focus on the communication skills and how we as analysts can actually transfer those important messages that we find back to the players, coaches and, and staff. So during today's session, what we will kind of focus on um, is just to have a bit of an introduction into some of the different guest speakers that we've got on today. Um, we'll go through a series of questions that we've put together based on some of your, the responses that you provided to uh, Andrew Butterworth um, on the initial kind of sign up a couple of weeks ago and then we'll open the floor up to any further questions and answers from yourself. So just a bit of a background into myself for those of you who don't know. Um, my experience in performance analysis started back at, in my undergraduate at the University of Worcester. Um, I started that degree in 2009 and finished that in 2012. During those three years I gained a number of different experiences um, primarily in rugby union working um, with a variety of different grassroots clubs all the way through to international teams um, so including Worcester Warriors and with the England women's rugby setup. During the kind of final year of my studies, um, British wheelchair basketball started using the University of Worcester as a central um, training base during the lead up to the 2012 Paralympic Games. Um, I was fortunate enough to gain some experience with them um, and then further kind of conversations led me to working um, with them for uh, during the Rio Paralympic um, Paralympic cycle um, and them actually funding a PhD. Since that I've kind of um, transferred those skills that I've learned into a variety of different setups uh, and currently work with the English uh, England football teams specifically with the, the para football unit. So that involves working with deaf, blind, visually impaired, power chair um, and other um, disabled athletes. So I then kind of transfer some all those skills into my lecturing role. So I'm currently the course leader at the University of Worcester for the master's program. Work with myself, uh, Mike Bateman, who's one of the other lecturers and Jamie Kite, who is our technical um, technical demonstrator um, and we therefore kind of work with a variety of different clubs and organizations around the country so hopefully inspiring the next generation of analysts. So that's a bit of a background into me and we're fortunate enough today to have um, four really really strong kind of individuals providing their own insights. Um, so we've got Steve Simmons, so he's had an experience within performance analysis for around about 15 years, following an initial kind of period with Wiccan Wanderers back in the old days, um, and, and his background is largely in, in the IT sector. We've also got Ben Wakefield, um, his kind of experience has largely been at QPR, um, both in the academy and first team setups. He's also worked with the England women's football team, uh, back in the 2015 World Cup, I believe. Um, so a variety of good kind of experience to draw upon there from different sectors. We've also got Andy Filer, um, who's been working with, who works with Leicester Tigers for a number of years, going through from Cardiff Blues, Welsh Rugby and consulting for the Canadian rugby teams. Um, and then finally, we've got Lance De Deluc, um, who's a massive experience in rugby league, worked with over six different Super League clubs within the United Kingdom and out in Spain, as well as consulting to, to France and England national teams, and more recently with the Australian Rugby League and the New Zealand Rugby League system. So that's the kind of background into our, our experts. Um, and, and those different experiences, both in, in football and rugby, but also between the different age groups um, and academy and first team settings, gives them brilliant kind of experience and range of, range of skills um, that they can kind of share, hopefully, with you guys during today's session. So to kind of kick off, the, the theme for today, as, we, as we've mentioned from the start, is to, to look at how we land those important key messages. So 
how we utilize software and, and break down the footage into important clips and collect that data. How do we actually then transfer that information that we're spending hours and hours and hours collating to those end users? Our ultimate aim of, in, uh, in performance analysis is to ensure that we're actually having an important impact on the uh, coaching process to inform and enhance future decision making. So how do we actually get those important messages across to those users? Uh, and that will be the focus of today's session. So for those of you whilst you're listening, um, if you have got any questions that you have, um, feel free to um, post them in the, in the Q and answer panel on the right hand side, uh, which will pop up once you've kind of clicked on this option down the bottom. Feel free to, to post them whilst the session's going on and we'll then kind of moderate um, and, and pick some of those questions as, as we get through further towards the end. So just to kind of start off then, um, the first question we're going to look at is how do you find out what information is important for coaches, players and other support staff? Um, so I'll probably fire this over, over to Ben to start with um, in terms of the, the experience in, in rugby. So how, how in rugby have you found those, ex how do you kind of find out the important information uh, in part of the performance analysis process? Uh, like looking at it from a, probably more from a football uh, perspective, John, if that's okay. Um, yeah. Um, so I guess, uh, how do you find out what information is most important? I guess uh, a lot of the clubs, certainly ones I've worked at, um, have a philosophy that's embedded into, um, into a lot of the, the coaching, the training sessions, um, uh, like the, the general ethos of the club. Um, so I think uh, like when you first go into a club or when you first join a club, whether it be as a part-time member of staff, an internal or full-time member of staff, you need to learn what the club philosophy is about. Uh, and that will vary from one club to another. And then off the back of that, you can then um, try and identify which bits of information based on the club's philosophy are relevant to which people. Um, there's a couple of key things you can look out for here. Um, generally, coaches, players and support staff will ask you um, – mainly for the same things each week like football's uh, uh, a bit of a cyclical process um, you have your games you review them you prepare, prepare for the next one so generally the coaches and players will ask probably ask for the same thing uh, on a repeated basis now once you know what they're after you can then almost like work in advance and try and prepare some of that um, just to kind of ease the pressure on yourself and also make sure that they get the, the detail uh, they need uh, in a timely manner um, the other thing to do is also to, to try and ask open-ended questions. So if you speak to a coach or the, the backroom staff and try and get an insight into how they view the game. Um, football generally is kind of considered the sport of opinions. Um, and those who've been involved will know what I mean by that. But um, you'll get an insight. Generally, most of them are more than happy to talk to you about the game. So you'll get an insight. And once you know how they look at the game, you can then, as I said, almost work ahead to try and prepare that information along with uh, kind of like your own interpretation of what you see as well. Um, a lot of it stems from, from like relationships, I guess, uh, and that takes time to build up. But as I said, having an awareness of what the philosophy is like and listening carefully to the questions they ask will give you like a really good um, opportunity to, to kind of maximize your, your knowledge and help them as best you can. Perfect. Thanks, Ben. And as part of that process then, work during your kind of time, um, were you then adjusting your, your kind of coding templates in order to provide more meaningful information based on those conversations that you'd had with those individuals? Yeah, yeah. Uh, to, like to a point, um, I think you, you do need to make sure it's consistent with the, the, the philosophy or the approach that, that the club has for sure. Um, once you've got an idea of the questions they ask, and as I said, they usually get repeated uh, reasonably frequently, um, you can then... Uh, incorporate them into your, to your code window to a certain extent. What we don't want to do is completely change the analysis we do from, from one game or one set of games to the next. Um, it's more just, uh, I think if you did that, you probably wouldn't have a consistent philosophy. Um, so that's the point, but um, you can certainly interpret it into the process you do. And as I said, once you're up and running, hopefully you can then work ahead and, and uh, provide information to them in, in quite a timely manner. No, perfect. No, thank you very much. And, and Andy, does that kind of transfer similarly in, into rugby or, or is it a completely different perspective from that side? 
I think there's a lot of um, transferable elements between all sorts of sports like that. So I want to echo, I guess, what Ben has said with a lot of it. Um, and uh, reading all the, the team documents, understanding the philosophy, being involved in those team meetings and coaches meetings, things like that is a great way to just understand. Um, but also, I guess, you know, it doesn't have to be in a, a structured environment like that always. Like you can ask for maybe like a one-to-one -one meeting with a coach um, but you could also, I don't know, over lunch, things like that, just chatting to those different coaches and just trying to dig, a, dig in a bit deeper and sort of understanding. Like if you do have any of those questions that you don't want to raise in maybe a team setting, have it at that lunch, like over lunch, and just have those sort of small conversations, just picking up little bits of information as you go along. Um, I think it's probably also to be aware of like, your your role within the environment so if you're going in as head analyst like have those discussions with the with the head coach or the director of rugby or something like that whereas if you're an assistant maybe you then talk to some of the assistant coaches and, and things like that um, or if you're an intern maybe you speak to the head of analysis rather than the coaches and things like that it's just sort of understanding your your environment that you're within as well so like if, if players are happy to sort of discuss things, like I've spoken to different players that are all, always happy to talk through different workflows and how they've, like if they've come from somewhere like Australia and how maybe the, the game's played differently over there, um, how they've trained, how they see analysis, how they see the, the team philosophy and things like that. So there's always just sort of different little bits that you can pick up on and try and implement within, within your workflow. And as like Ben said, that you can look to um, put this into your coding, but you know, predominantly try and stick with um, a structured workflow and then you can have these additions on uh, if you see, if you see fit. Uh, perfect. No, and just on, on a couple of those things that you, you, you mentioned there, how how uh, influential has the, that, the culture of different individuals coming across uh, players or coaches, how is that kind of, when dealing with and acknowledging those different cultural aspects, how important is that for you to consider as an analyst? Yeah, I think I think it's, it. it's great. Like, it's good to, you know, if, if you, you've got everyone from one place, it's always you get sort of stuck in your stuck in your way you think that you're doing the best thing but suddenly if you just I guess you've got to be receptive to those ideas and different philosophies so you know maybe maybe they think that's the best way coming from an external environment but then you can put things back on them so it's sort of a, a give and take that it's not you just go okay well they've done it somewhere else so it must be better like maybe your way is better and maybe you can sort of impact their workflow and make them better as well so I think just sort of taking everything into account and um, yeah, make an adjustment based on that, really. Okay, my right, good. And, and Simo, do you think um, potentially aspects differ between uh, academy settings and maybe more senior settings in terms of what is important for those coaches? Yeah, I think it can do. I think it also is dependent on sport and the link between academies and like the first team, if you like. Um, you'll find that some sports have a philosophy that will filter down all the way down from the top. You'll find that others are maybe not quite so conjoined, a little bit, bit separate. So I think it, it certainly depends on who you're, um, who you're dealing with, as the guy said, said already. Um, but I don't know. I think overall that it's, for, for me, the delivery of this, finding out about the information is gauging the feedback that you've given them um, and, and sort of tweaking it accordingly. I think it really does depend on who you're dealing with. Okay, no, perfect. And that kind of links nicely into our, our second question that we've, that we've got up here um, in terms of what methods of information and, and feeding back the information have you found to be, su to be successful? So, so if you want to just kind of carry on um, Answer, answering this if you don't mind in terms of what methods and things have you found to be most successful yeah sure I think the first question part of this really is around uh, who it is you're feeding back to I think you've got to be very aware as to whether you're feeding back to to coaches um, head coaches directors sporting directors players I think it's important to ensure you have a good understanding as to who that is um, 
you'll find that some of those much prefer sort of tangible feedback, something they could physically hold and see and look at in their hands, take with them, whereas others are quite happy to, to um, receive the feedback uh, sort of digitally, um, sent to them in any number of different ways, which I'm sure we'll cover some of those later. But but I think it's it's you've got to be careful around the complexity you're delivering as well. Um, there's going to be different levels of understanding, but again, which feeds back to my first point as to who it is you're feeding back to. So the, the information and the methods of feeding that information back um, also depends on what it is key points are you're trying to get across is it better backed up with video or is it just more of a data source and how do they receive that it's knowing your your the people you're feeding back to okay no perfect and, and that kind of links nicely almost to, to asking ben does does in terms of that information differ when you may be looking at pre-match and post-match or, or how or is it kind of a consistent process and methods that you use when disseminating that information yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, uh, I think, like Simmer said, it depends on who you who you're dealing with. Uh, certainly, my experiences with like the uh, the younger players, so players as young as eight, all the way up to uh, like senior first team pros, uh, your approach will differ. Um, for pre match, generally, uh, most information will be given uh, probably by the coaches. So your role as an analyst would be to assist in pre preparing for that. Um, you may get an opportunity to, to provide some, uh, some kind of input at some stage. Uh, but most of the time, uh, usually in elite football, we'll go through the coach initially. Um, Post-match, I'd say that uh, in my experiences, generally, um, and again, it varies depending on who you're dealing with, but like smaller groups and shorter duration sessions seem to be more effective than, than the opposite, like big groups where you're speaking to players for like longer than 20 minutes or so. Uh, and generally it's like one directional. Um, that's, I guess, kind of like a traditional view of performance analysis, like the coach staying at the front, giving a lot of detail, a lot of information and players generally switching off. Um, in my experiences, like working with the younger age groups, I think doing shorter duration sessions and trying to make them interactive, um, perhaps doing like a carousel where they get to rotate and do different tasks. Um, not just necessarily viewing footage and answering questions, but giving them the opportunity to take control um, perhaps pre prepare and give some some feedback as well so they could be the ones initiating the post-match process for example uh, and then they, and then their peers could also ask questions so there's certain levels to it and as I said uh, kind of Simo's mentioned already like it depends on who you're dealing with as to what kind of approach um, may work best generally in my experience smaller groups and, and shorter durations are probably um, probably most effective in my opinion and what, just picking up on on some questions or on some of the points there. So why, over the over the last kind of ten years, we've almost seen that that change in how performance analysis is delivered from that, that head coach being the figure figurehead at, at the front of, of a classroom almost to now that, that group kind of sessions. Why? Do, what do you think is the, the the main reason for for that change of almost delivery approach? And why is it almost moved to that kind of smaller group sessions? Uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. I mean, uh, just, just to clarify, so the, the big traditional view, as I call it, um, with the coach at the front, that still exists. Um, and some coaches will opt for it more than others. So again, I think it's, it's driven by who's in charge and kind of relates back to the, the, the philosophy of the club and the kind of staff you've got involved. Um, I don't know, I think technology has got a big part to play with it. So the last, um, certainly over the last five to 10 years or so, players have got access to uh, to digital libraries they're you know much more in tune with um, using technology as part of their learning and I think using uh, like building analysis into those kind of avenues really helps um, so players are most players even as young as nine or ten nowadays are happy to use an iPad or can sit down and use a laptop quite well so why not um, have an analysis session that makes use of those skills and then as I said you can try and check for learning and build their knowledge into that uh, hopefully it's something they enjoy and if it's not you can uh, try and address that separately but uh, I think technology over the last five or ten years has had a big part to play in, in shifting that emphasis away from being just a, a monotone one directional uh, platform to being much more uh, interactive particularly as I said with the with the younger age groups. Oh, perfect and, and Andy in terms of kind of rugby um, do you see more of the the backs or forwards kind of 
does information get delivered differently um, between those different groups of players um, to ensure those key messages are, are uh, absorbed by those players? I think at, like the, at the higher level that ultimately the, the, the methods are, are pretty similar. Like they can have basically sort of tailoring it to that, those smaller groups, all those individuals is definitely the, the, the best way to go. So whether it is backs, forwards as a team, individuals, like overall the, the goal is still the same. So like there might be slightly different methods of how you implement things and like whether like you understand how, how that particular group um, receives that feedback. So whether, you know, whether um, I don't know, like the forwards would look at maybe some more um, output windows that they've got a breakdown of um, the line outs and where the particular the throw is gone or like in a particular zone where, where a throw goes so they can really break down how if a team comes in a particular formation where, where they're predicting it's going to go and then they can sort of implement that on the field um, and you know also, like you could do it in the same way for backs but maybe they want to just sort of see the vision more rather than the stats and things like that so there's a lot of um, you can interchange it really um, but tailoring that feedback to those groups is definitely the, um, the best way to go and, and I think a lot of it has changed so sort of Ben saying about like the technology improving and I guess it's sort of the coaches, coaching staff and the players understanding what analysis is about now. Like before, I guess it was probably seen as like, you know, you're the stats man, you're the video man, whatever it is. Um, whereas now sort of you're a key sort of element in that coaching process um, and they want, want you more involved. So the more feedback, uh, the better that you can, you can have an impact on the team. Okay. And just just a, a thought almost in terms of potential for Lance, how does that maybe differ if you're not specifically working with a team but more in a, in a potential consultancy role and, and with a more organisational focus? Um, does your Is it more kind of report-based information that you're delivering then rather than that, that kind of uh, meeting-based opportunities? Yeah, definitely. Um, normally when you're in a consultancy um, situation, it is answering specific questions that have been posed to you. So you don't have that daily sort of like feel around the place um, as such if you're working from a distance. So like certainly we're preparing for tours and things like that. You, um, you're gathering information and it's not until you actually get in camp with the, with the team that you, you then move into um, you know, basically what Andy's talking about, where you, you do have that more daily to and fro in and being able to uh, pick up information and have those those meetings, you know, whether that be small group meetings or one-to-one -one meetings, um, you know. So, yeah, so definitely I'd, I'd say start with the consultancy, definitely starts with the reports. And then almost linking kind of question one and two together, there's been a lot of focus on, importance of understanding the environment and building those relationships how have you how do you go about that almost being that remote kind of nature of some of, some of the work that you do Lance? the remote nature of it yeah and all, so, and all, yeah sorry sorry no go on um, yeah and almost the remote nature or, or maybe um having that only kind of two week window when you're in, in a tournament mode or in a camp how does that kind of lead up look like um, if you're trying to build those relationships and get an understanding of what the sports or team are wanting? Normally I'd, I'd pick out two or three key individuals within a team. So who, who has the most influence? Focus on them because you can direct the message through those people rather than trying to get around people yourself and, and feedback information. And the other thing is that, you know, if, you, if you're directing it through um, a gatekeeper as such, then you know that the message once it's delivered by them or, or keep on on track with what the team have been preparing when you've not been around and not seen um so keeping that consistency of message so they kind of they absorb the information that you're giving them and then they deliver it themselves uh, back to the team in the manner that they know um certain individuals will respond to uh, and maybe not in a way that you could and by that i mean some individuals might 
accept a more aggressive form of feedback, um, direct form of feedback. Coming from a teammate and a peer, that's acceptable, that's fine. Coming from you as an outsider, as a consultant, is not fine um, because you haven't earned the right to actually feedback in that manner to them. So you have to be really careful. And the safest approach is definitely through another individual in the team. And by building that trust with those key individuals in the team, once the rest of the team know that um, you're speaking with them and, that, and they trust your opinion, then that opens up the rest of the team to then come in and asking you questions like Andy was saying over lunch and um, just, you know, when you're on the way to training or on the way to a game and things like that, they will, they will openly just come and ask you, uh, because you have built that, but it's a, a kind of a slowish process. No, perfect, and, and and kind of nice insight into a slightly different route that, that some of some of the individuals on on this um, Zoom call might be going down or could be doing, and especially in, in the time that we're in at the moment. So yeah, really good insight, and kind of links nicely as well onto onto the next question in terms of who should be that one giving that and, and feeding that information. So I've, I've in, in the past been the one giving sometimes the information, otherwise it's sometimes going through, through a gatekeeper as Lance, as Lance has said. So um, Ben or, or Andy, do you want to kick off with, with this one in terms of um, from your different kind of sports, sport um, knowledge and environments, have you been the ones typically delivering the information or do you pass it on to the coach for them to deliver that information back to the players? Uh, I'll, I'll take the lead, Fyla, to start with, mate. Um, I think uh, I think probably a mix, John. If I'm honest, um, certainly uh, when you join a club or when you're when you're new to it, um, generally most of the information will be fed back, fed back through the um, the coaching staff. Um, I think that the key here is to have uh, like strong relationships. So over time, once you've embedded yourself in the team, hopefully, and you've got really good relationships with the coaching staff, with the support staff. Uh, and they trust uh, that you're on board with the club philosophy, which we spoke about earlier, um, you, they, you may then get the opportunity to be the one who's directly feeding back to the players. Um, as we spoke about before, ideally that's in small groups, so you can make it specific to their position and also to their, uh, like their individual needs. Um, but it may also be to a large group as well, but there's no way uh, that coaches, particularly the head coach and the manager, are letting you do that if they don't trust what you're going to do. The worst thing you can do as an analyst would be to deliver something that's not consistent with what the coach wants um, and also not consistent with like the, the philosophy or the approach to the club. You're likely to get um, uh, in severe trouble if you, if you went off cuff there. So just going back to your experiences at, at QPR, um, how, how long do you reckon it was before you even started being potentially asked to deliver little snippets of information or... Um, being, being a, a key kind of component in those pre-match or post-match uh, meetings? Um, that's a good question. Like, uh, it varied depending on who, who I was working with. Um, it's because I worked across different age groups as well. Um, sometimes you, you develop a, a quicker relationship with some coaches more than others. Um, and also some coaches don't want to necessarily give up that, that feeling of control. They want to be the go-to guy. They want to be the one that, that coordinates the way that the team's going to play, the way that they're going to feed back. So um, it, it does vary depending on who you're working with. Generally, I'd say it probably takes, um, I'd say the best part of the first year to, to get them to, to trust you and to trust your, your judgments that you're making. Um, but don't forget along the way, they're going to put a couple of tests in um, to try and make sure that you, you can answer and you are consistent with the approach that the, that the, um, the club and the coach have got. Now, if you slip up along the way, then the opportunity to feed back directly to the players probably gets a little bit further away because they don't trust you. So, um, so it, yeah, it, it does vary. I'd say probably, in answer to your question, probably at least a year, certainly in my experiences, uh, sometimes quicker, sometimes a bit longer, depending on who, which kind of coach you're working with. Okay, so um, just picking up on one of those points, um, how, do, how do those coaches kind of maybe test you or... or uh bit of a trial what was what was one of those examples that maybe you kind of reflect on and, and think that worked well or didn't work well yeah um so by test i mean um like coaches have sometimes they'll ask you for for pieces of work which um 
which has probably got some value, but they don't really need. Um, and this may seem like a really silly thing to do, but what they're trying to do is just to see whether, uh, whether you're willing to put the work and the time and effort in and also whether the detail you provide back is, as I said, is it consistent with the messages they're sending? And often they'll choose, um, in my experiences, they'll probably, I don't know, ring you late at night uh, and knowing that you've got a nine o'clock meeting tomorrow. So they'll give you something that's really tight. You haven't got much time to do it. Um, and they want to see whether you're willing to put the time and effort in. You may need to go like deep into the night to, to get stuff turned around. Now, ultimately, when it comes to Monday morning, I know that they don't really want the work. They know they don't want it either. But as I said, what they're trying to do, he just wants to know that when you turn up on Monday morning, you present that work to him and say, look, this is what you asked for. Regardless whether he uses it or not, they're interested to see, okay, is this guy willing to work? Is he going to put, is he a grafter? Is he going to, you know, is he willing to put the time and effort in to, to help us? Um, so it's little tests like that. As I said, it's the, the work itself isn't the, isn't the, the overriding um, thing here it's more like they're, they're trying to judge your character and just to kind of suss you out and this usually happens when you when you join a club initially because they're not too sure about um about who you are and how you fit with things but if you can pass these tests these small tests then um ultimately it helps build the relationship and as things progress you may get the opportunity to to take uh, control or have an input to these these feedback sessions so it is important even though at the time perhaps the the work itself isn't uh, isn't like the overriding uh, thing to be aware of here yeah no perfect and, and nice kind of yeah it kind of brings back memories of some, some of the little uh long hours of, of tasks and you, you produce that work uh, on that monday morning and yeah. it's not even looked at and it's you just you kind of think oh i've spent loads of time but then the coaches then come up to you the following week going oh okay you've, you've produced that bit of work can you go and do this and this is how we've influenced it or used it into practice so, so brilliant in terms then Andy um, does that kind of those experiences and um, maybe you leading sessions in, in rugby is that a common kind of situation you're exposed to or were exposed to yeah definitely and I think Ben and Lance nailed it with the trust side like you don't get those sort of opportunities until you've earned that trust so um, you know more often than not if those coaches do give you a task like that um, they probably know the answer as well, so that, like you said, that they don't actually need your your input. But they, if you can sort of align yourself with their thoughts, then then you start to build those opportunities. Um, like I was, I was sort of tasked by one of our our head coaches as like if if he wasn't there, like if he was off sick or something like that for the day, like he wanted me to be so ingrained with everything and have like the same philosophy that I could to, like deliver those sessions for him. So it's not necessarily always actually delivering that feedback to the players. Um, it's just being prepared to do it if, if needed. Um, and I'd also like, it's not just about feeding back to the players, it's feeding back to the coaches as well, because that's a lot of, um, you get probably a lot more opportunities to do that. So like, sort of a lot of the environments I've seen that uh, the, the big team meetings is, should be driven by the coach. Um, Whereas you can feed that information to that coach who can then relay that um, and then you can offer sort of advice with that as well. So that, that's sort of, I guess, the route that I went down and trying to sort of influence the coaches and then maybe um, having like a leadership meeting with like the key players. So like I could deliver that information to them as well. So rather than just the coaches, you then get some of the players involved. And then because sometimes I guess the, the messages can be better coming from uh, their, their own peers, so like player to player. So if you can give that information across to them that you've built from your analysis, um, then it can have a greater impact rather than you actually delivering it yourself, you delivering it to somebody else who can then deliver it um, in that meeting or something like that. Okay, no good. And in terms of working then with those players, um, how did you kind of go about that? Would you identify a couple of, of players who brought into the analysis or were always in the in the video rooms and use them as, as a kind of a platform to, to start those conversations and get those messages across or, or a different method yeah oh definitely like that that's a great way to do it because like some people like some people are old school or just don't want to want to do it they're, they're not not always interested in the our side of things but some people just love it and they're you know whatever you can give them they will look at it and they'll look uh, 
give you feedback on it so you can then start building those conversations. So that's one of the ways that I, like when I first joined um, Leicester, going in as like an intern and then working your way up, you, you're gradually having more and more conversations like that. So even if you are an intern and you're sort of going into the video room and maybe, I don't know, putting a, um, a game or some analysis on the, on the server or on particular computers, then like players will be in and out and you can sort of see what they're doing. And you can just make, like, ask, a, ask a couple of questions as you're going through. Like, it doesn't have to be that sort of structured um, meeting environment that just those passing conversations can all like, be really valuable um, and can improve your knowledge massively. So, because I, I, was, um, I was a back, I was a, a scrum half playing, and then I sort of ended up going into doing a lot of the forwards um, and line out analysis. Um, so having those sort of conversations with, um, with the line out leaders and sort of maybe some of the younger guys that are learning it themselves as well and how, how they've learned it, how you can then influence your own analysis through like learning of, of the, the play style and things like that. Good. And, and, and Simo, just to kind of finish up this question, um, how much of the, of the type of data and, and the technology that's available influences on on who kind of delivers that so if you're working in a in maybe a first team environment with with loads of equipment loads of software does that influence maybe who compared to a, a, a semi-professional club maybe who hasn't got as much resources may influence who's um, delivering that feedback I, I think regardless of the level that you're you're talking about i think it's about this feedback needs to be clear and concise i think it's very easy to get so caught up in all of the technology that is potentially available to you. And you end up trying to utilize the technology rather than focusing on what the important feedback is you're trying to get across. So just because you have a new technology toy, you, you I've seen in the past, you see some coaches who are desperate to use it despite the fact it might not actually enhance um, the delivery of that message. So I don't, like I say, I don't think it matters if what level we're necessarily talking about, but I would always um, go with the, the, the clear, short, concise feedback methods rather than the bells and whistles just because it looks nice. Perfect. And, and kind of linking on to how, how we go about communicating um, those important inf messages. Um, obviously, with, with the situation we're in, um, the use of online platforms uh, is becoming a massive uh, element of, of our kind of performance analysis processes. And from the clubs I've been speaking to, there's almost a massive increase in terms of the the use of video to, uh, as a metric and, and tool to, to bridge the, the lack of on grass kind of playing as a team or individual. Um, Lance, how, how do you think... Um, the best way to kind of use those online tools to in, engage those players. What's the kind of, is there a, is there a right way to do it or, or is it just a case of trialing error and tailoring it to the, the culture and philosophy of those clubs? I would always uh, lead with a question. So we have um, various mechanisms open to us and one of them is um, our Huddle Academy platform where it's a, it's a learning platform and you could ask someone to just go and have a look at some of the courses on there um, and leave it to them and just let them go about, you know, whether they do or don't engage. Alternatively, you could have a question that they need to answer. So, for example, if they're talking about coding games, um, creating code windows, for example, scripting, then you could say, okay, well, the answers you need are actually in, you know, say a scripting level one course. So go away and have a look at that and then, and then always engage another question after, you know, what did you learn? You know, how did it help you? Did it help you? If not, why not? Um, because if you don't, if you leave people to their own devices, then they'll, they'll kind of go off. It's like falling down a bit of a rabbit hole with, um, you know, with YouTube. You, you go off on a tangent if you're not directed at what you're, what you're actually trying to learn. Um, so, so, yeah, so start with your question then let them engage with the material. If it really interests them, they'll keep engaging and keep engaging and they'll come back with more questions, uh, but then follow it up as well at the end of it. So you, are, you do have that, that sort of like that beginning, middle, end to, to one question, and then that should lead on then to other questions as well. 
perfect. And, and Ben, when when using these online platforms and kind of posing those questions, does the the level of engagement and the types of question you ask differ depending on the the age group and, and the players that you're working with? Uh, well, I, if it doesn't, I certainly think it should do, uh, John. Um, like for for younger players, if you if you hit them hard with a, a, a complicated question or or one that's got um, like respectfully big words or, or unfamiliar terms, you're probably not going to get the engagement that you're after. Um, and a simple way of adjusting that would be to use um, use terms they're familiar with. But um, ultimately, it goes back to what we we talked about at the start with the the club's philosophy. They'll um, particularly at QPR, we had certain terms, things like red zone, um, uh, hit the blue, that no that no one else would know about unless you were at QPR because it's part of the philosophy. So. You can use the the club's philosophy to try and like embed them into the uh, into the questions that you ask, but you would you would alter them depending on which kind of age group you're you're dealing with. So younger players will probably need simplifying, um, and hopefully you can uh, you can still challenge individuals in that age group. But as you progress through the age groups towards um, almost like full competency towards your your pros, you can ask hopefully more detailed questions that are much more specific to to their position to uh, to kind of their understanding to specific moments in time uh, and, and kind of real dive down into that detail. Uh, I guess the main crux of it here is that yeah, uh, like online platforms for me, you, you're, trying to, you're trying to check for learning ultimately. You're trying to see what the, players, what the players know and what do they understand. And by posing questions, as Lance said, often open-ended questions and seeing what kind of responses you get back from players, you get a really nice insight as to, to what the players know or, or perhaps what they don't know. Um, when we've done it before at QPR, um, we used uh, we used the huddle platform um, substantially across all the age groups. Um, uh, you'll find that some players will give quite detailed feedback and others others won't. But what was perhaps more um, surprising was that some players wouldn't answer the question that you, you posed them. Um, so that kind of suggests perhaps either they don't understand the question or perhaps they don't have the knowledge to understand the question. And it's the second bit that would, you, you then feeds back to the coaches and hopefully integrate it into their individual learning plan. So, um, so as you, I mean, as you mentioned at the start, like it, it, it will vary. The questions you ask will vary depending on which individuals you're dealing with. And, and ideally, I would tier it um, up the age groups. Hopefully, adding more detail, more complexity to to the higher age groups. Yeah, no, perfect. And, and, and that's the whole uh, the benefit of using using Huddle, for example, as one of those, those tools in terms of how you can you can tailor the content um, for, for individuals um, as well as, as tailoring those questions. So from your kind of experiences um, with utilizing Huddle, um, what, would you kind of tailor the, the content and the clips for maybe the younger players to be more positive or would you leave that uh, quite open for them to kind of filter through and, and link to their development plans? Um what do you think should be kind of yeah yeah that's that's a, that's a good way of phrasing it um like for, for me um like every every clip or every example that we would ever produce whether it be like montages of videos or um best practice videos it would always be philosophy specific i know i keep drumming on about that term but um we use the platform as a way of reinforcing subtly reinforcing that the playing style with, that we want the boys to incorporate both on and off the ball um i would um I would probably flip it on his head, John, if I'm honest, and I would get the players to be the ones that either pose their own questions or provide, like, generate their own video, which they can then present back, or they can get their peers to ask the questions. And again, as I said, like, what we're doing here is we're trying to let, we're, we're checking for learning, essentially. We're trying to see what they understand and perhaps more importantly, what they don't understand. And then um, we can take, uh, take action along with the coaches to try and help make them better players. Ultimately, that's the... The overarching aim of everyone at the club is to, to try and make them better and prepare them for, for first team football. Yeah, no, massively, and I, and I really like the idea of kind of balancing questions within within the players or even the coaching staff. Um, so you're you're not just learning off um, the coach or or a more senior player. You're enabling that broader discussion um, that hopefully is going to ultimately improve that performance and your ability to um, answer some of those um, questions um, and find a more creative solution that other teams who are maybe scouting you um, won't be necessarily able to, to come up with. So no, brilliant. 
Um, and then kind of relating it, we've talked about and the use of performance analysis at this moment in time with the situation. When kind of sport resumes, um, how do you think kind of those key messages during kind of game, in-game situations, how do those key messages get delivered? Do things change? Um, so Simo, if, if you want to kind of kick start, start with this kind of uh, question, how does the, the key messages um, change maybe at halftime within sports or how are they delivered across um, at halftime? Yeah, I think, John, when you're uh, delivering these key messages, firstly, you need to be well aware of what the laws of the game allow as to how you go about delivering it. Um, I know that some of those things recently have changed as to what is and isn't allowed on in the dugouts, etc. cetera. Um, but also, I think you need to think about where those people are that you're trying to deliver the messages to. I mean, in the past, I've had it where I've got an assistant coach who's sat, who was sat next door to me. So delivering messages him to take to the to the manager at half time or the head coach was no problem because he's literally looking over your shoulder and he's he's telling you the bits he wants to see or what is important. But then obviously there's the more slightly more advanced workflows when you start using things like a, a huddle replay or kind of output windows HTML export. So you're delivering stuff live to the bench, but with all technology, obviously you've got to have the infrastructure, et cetera, to deliver those messages. So if you if you wind it back to, uh, let's say, uh, uh, an amateur level, advanced amateur level, they they can be literally using anything from a WhatsApp group, uh, just to in ear radios, you know, just to delivering those key messages. But I think as the analyst, you need to be well aware as to what the coaching staff deem as key moments or. Like those those areas that they're definitely going to want to see. If you've got that understanding, then delivering those to the coach, be it in game, half time, second half, in between periods, whenever it happens to be, I think I think that's key. I think the, the methodology is kind of up to you and um, what the technology you have enables you to do. Um, but I also think that as time progresses, that whole mobility around the delivery of those key messages gets easier. Uh, and I think that will continue to happen anyway. And, and kind of within football, we see that the rules are, the rules are slightly changing over the, or change over the last couple of seasons. How big of an effect do you think that's had on how coaches kind of prepare and utilise uh, performance analysis during games? I, th I think it's, it's very variable coach to coach. I think one of the guys mentioned earlier around how some uh, of the say, let's say slightly newer coaches a lot more uh, receptive to performance analysis and how it can be delivered and used whereas perhaps some of the slightly older coaches less so but I, I do think again as time moves forward we'll see more and more um, making use of that in-game uh, delivery of, of video or data whatever they choose just to affect the change live which ultimately is, is what it's all about. There's no point talking about what you should have done after the game because the game's gone. It's making those changes live so that it's impactful there and then. Oh, perfect. And, and Andy, uh, mentioned kind of that, that football's only just kind of moving towards that technology, whereas rugby's had it probably a couple more years and, and obviously the coaches in, in rugby tend to, to sit with the analysts. How, how do you think does that, does the, messages that get delivered to the players differ um, or, or is it kind of consistent there? Um, there? I guess there are some differences because being up in the stands you've got a better view maybe, like maybe like the football guys don't think they've got the the connection as much but everyone like up in the up in the stands is generally mic'd up and they can have that impact and you can send those messages down um, so like it, I guess it just depends really how you how you see yourself like as an analyst I would much prefer to be up in the stands with that better view doing like a, a multi-angle capture having everything um, there in front of you um, rather than being I guess given a message from from above um, so it was something that you know I, I wanted everything that I could have um, I've been lucky enough to work with some coaches that have been really receptive to analysis as well. Um, but 
even some of those coaches, they don't want everything um, in front of them. So that's why you've got to sort of in, be that interpreter in between. So you can give those uh, key messages. Cause I had something like a, like a all singing, all dancing output window that the coaches loved post game. Um, but then in game, it's just sort of too much information. So I could, I would have that in front of me. I would take that information, like decipher it and go right to the coach, right? This is the, the key thing that we need to, uh, from the opposition analysis that we've done in the week, this is what I can see. The, these are the trends that are coming up. And then that message can get delivered down to, down to pitch side and then onto the pitch and have that impact um, live in game. As Simo said, that, that's, the, that's the ultimate goal, isn't it? Um, to make that impact in game and score a try, score a goal, end up winning the game because of your analysis and your, the, the meetings that you've, you've listened to and the information that you can give down to the, to the coaches and then to the team. Oh, perfect. And, and just picking up further on, on some things that I've just, just thought about, um, how does, um, we're, in terms of kind of set up uh, in rugby, uh, from my experience, either that some clubs have the head analyst as almost that, that um, link between, between the coaches who isn't actually coding some of those games, whereas other clubs will have, have the kind of a team of analysts um, coding and those outputs all get sent just straight to the coach. Um, if, the, if that kind of head analyst is that mediator between um, the information, what what skills do they almost need to develop to to be effective in in that mediation of performance analysis data and translating it into those key messages? It's just, I guess it always goes back to that team philosophy and like understanding those coaches and what you can actually impact within the game. So you get because you get so much information like you like if you've got a team of analysts working together like we had somebody doing like a general team code we had somebody else adding in extra information to that we had the sports science uh, like sports scientists adding extra info and gps data so you get a lot of info coming in so it's picking out just those key um key messages that you've seen from those team meetings leading up to that particular game and what I guess you can also look at things that you see as maybe that hasn't been like discussed the whole time in those uh, pre-match meetings, but things that you pick up on and go, okay, we're at, these are actual the key influences within the game. So something that you know, generally wasn't talked about with us, but we looked at things like uh, 22 entries um, and then get, like generating points from those. So obviously the, the more entries and then the more points you can get, obviously the, the chances of you winning are going to be higher. Um, so if, if we were sort of down in a key area like that, that we could sort of get those messages and try and influence that. Like how do you get into those zones to create um, opportunities and things like that? So it's, there's a lot of it, I guess, goes back to that team philosophy and understanding what, what, messages the coaches want to deliver and then how you can influence those messages getting onto the pitch no, perfect and and kind of the the next this question that we're currently looking at and, and the next one kind of almost linked together and and I'll, I'll pose it to kind of lance in terms of we're seeing more and more of the, the scripting um being involved in kind of dashboards um how 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 have those how has that advanced over the last couple of years and, and from the coaches that you kind of worked with or now work with uh, and the analysts that you work with, how has that kind of evolved in terms of um, ensuring those messages get, get across? I think, um, I mean, speaking personally, I think sort of output windows, dashboards, when I look at a lot of them, and this is across the board, all softwares, um, looking online, I often go on and online and have a look and see what other people are doing and such like. Some of them are so cluttered with so much information on there. It'd be very difficult. So touching on what um, Andy's just said there about messages and everything going back to coaches, it'd be really difficult to home in on on what's really relevant and really important. So it it'd almost be like having like having a split dashboard so you'd have one that would have everything on it so all the information you could possibly need but the the viewing part of it that you would see or the coach would see would be on those two or three key points in the game that you believe is giving you the best chance of winning that game because they're the most important metrics 
and if if I was getting information in a lot of information in and there was nothing really of relevance to feed back to the coaches at any given time, then I wouldn't say anything to the coaches, but I would feed back to the, the assistant analysts and say they're doing a great job and keep the information coming such like, but, but yeah, keep it. Don't, don't think that just because you have all the information, all the information has to be visible to the coaches because it'll just confuse them. They just want to see uh, a, a really good example in rugby league would be, uh, things like kick chase plus two so the plus two relates to the first two tackles after the kick chase has happened and whether or not you're winning that now you could clutter up your dashboard with tons of other information about how much distance you're getting on your kicks and everything else like that it's not relevant it, what's relevant is did you or did you not win those two and what's your percentage on that and that's what you would feed back to the coaches if it was going above a certain or sorry below a certain threshold that you actually needed. So, so yeah, so there can be a tendency there to actually try and prove how clever you are by using a lot of scripting and a really, really complicated output window against what you really should be doing, which is staying on message, staying focused and giving back, like uh, Simo was saying, giving back relevant information that's going to help you win the game. So don't, you know, basically don't put yourself ahead of the team in, in that sense. Yeah, no, perfect. And again, it's kind of sinking down all of that massive amounts of information that we're getting, not only from the kind of information that we're coding ourselves, but also potentially secondary company information that's been filtered in as well. So that's that's a key role that I see evolving even further is being able to remove that clutter and all that information and data we've got down to those key simple messages. So really good. Simo, um, are there any other tools that um, you've kind of used or have experience in, in, in aiding that uh, transfer of information to those players or coaches? Uh, I think something that's become more prevalent is the use of, sort of touch screens. I think I think this can be useful, especially if you're showing um, perhaps a younger members of the team as to expectations. You can encourage them to get more involved in those messages and going back to something that Ben mentioned earlier to ensure they have good understanding of the expectation. So it could be set some sort of set plays, for example, or expectation of positioning on the pitch based on what's going on. So I think that the whole touch screen has certainly made it a lot easier uh, and simpler for everybody to get involved uh, when it comes to ensuring the understanding of the messages. But again, I think it comes down to who, who you're trying to get those messages across to as to the tools that you're available to me. I mean, there's, there's things like we see the use of like huge screens, which people have probably read about, you see on a pitch for instant feedback to players in training. So it really comes down to where are you trying to deliver the message as well as what the message is you're trying to deliver and who you're trying to deliver it to. Um, but then you can, wind it back and use things as simple as just like Excel reports using data that you've maybe <clears throat> collated in your sports code, taken out of your sports code to generate a report in Excel. Maybe you're not a, a whiz, perhaps like Lance with a, the whole scripting and you're not quite up to your the HTML exports or the output windows, but you can handle yourself in Excel. So you can always use those as tools just to, visually present some stuff you don't have the linking to the video which is a disadvantage but sometimes people just like to see a nice pie chart or spirograph or or the or similar but anything ipads iphones you name it they all those tools out there can be utilized depending on the environment you're working in you yeah, know massive and i think like the, the thing about kind of touch screens it said at the start i feel that's going to be something massive that comes out in terms of even potentially coding off them um, and that ability to, to multiple users to feed into that information and that process of then feeding that back to directly uh, during the game. So no, that's really good. In terms then of, of um, our next kind of question that we've got um, is sometimes we as analysts potentially um, uncover some information that may uh, not be aligned with the philosophy or, or might challenge um, some of those coaches' preconceptions. Um, ben, how would you kind of go about potentially delivering this information so that 
the importance of kind of relationships and trust that we've mentioned previously it doesn't always um, to, um, erode and become almost distrust yeah this is a this is a good question i think if you if you're an analyst and you get this wrong it could probably be the last thing you do at the club um so there's a couple of a uh, couple of key points that i would make on this one um Firstly, if you're going to challenge the coach or coaches on, on anything, um, I wouldn't necessarily do it publicly. Um, so like opting to, to undermine them in a team meeting is considered somewhat suicidal. And if you're going to go down that approach, I would probably pack your bags and clear your desk before you do so. Um, I, think, uh, I think you're right. I think the, the relationships you have with the, the coaching staff is, is absolutely crucial here. Um, and it does come down to trust. Um, for me, uh, I would always do it um, subtly, like uh, well away from, from uh, prying eyes, so well away from in front of the players. Um, I would also start by, um, by asking a question. So as opposed to me going in uh, as an analyst and trying to press my view onto a coach or, or coaches, I'd probably ask him a question. You may show a clip and, and ask him, you know, what do you see? Or if we play out from the back against a high press, what, where do you want your pivot to be? Like which side? And most coaches are more than happy to talk to you about the game. That's, that's what they love. That's what, what they've grown up um, being involved in. So they'll offer you a response and then you may get the opportunity to, to challenge them slightly. Um, the way you go about this is, is key. Um, so you need to listen really carefully to the responses they give um, because that's your, that's your clues as to whether you can persist with the challenge or whether you should actually go, you know what, this isn't a good time because he's upset or he's emotional or, uh, there's other things going on that um, that could have uh, big repercussions should I persist with the challenge. So um, listen carefully to the responses they, they give you. O ask open-ended questions. And if the opportunity is there, um, subtly put your point across, but do it in a way that's, that's not necessarily undermining their power. Um, and then hopefully as you do so, you may say to them, well, uh, maybe I'll, you know, if, we, if we do play out from the back against the high press, for example, like, would you consider having your, your, one of your opposite uh, midfielders drop into the space instead? And he may say, okay, well, you know, what do you mean? So the next thing I'd say is just make sure you've got evidence or something, excuse me, something to support your argument. Um, often if you show coaches something or you, you come out with a flippant comment, they'll probably say, well, what have you got to back that up? What, you know, what, what, what does that mean? So just, um, just make sure you're prepared for it because um, there's no guarantee that you'll come out the, the, the challenge uh, unscathed. Um, yeah, just as I said, just something that you need to you need to consider carefully. If you if you get it wrong, it could probably be the last thing you do. Um, so uh, think carefully about how you how you kind of go about things. With my advice. Uh, some some brilliant kind of kind of learning points and, and key messages there in terms of knowing knowing the environment and knowing when best to kind of have those conversations um, and trying to be subtly tactical in how you potentially go that. And a lot of the time we get almost uh, misunderstand the importance of communication that is not a one-way process it's a two-way process the ability to listen and answer ask meaningful questions is, is really important um andy do you have kind of any similar kind of tips to those offered by ben or, or would you go about it in a slightly different way no but like ben's ben's bang on with what he said like you've got to you pick pick those sort of battles that you that ultimately you can well you can win or you can have sort of some sort of conversation around um i guess sometimes um it's good to maybe float that idea with one of the assistant coaches to start with like okay like maybe you don't have that that direct relationship with the head coach or something like that so you've got that relationship with one of the other coaches that they can go okay well this is what i'm seeing um and i think that's probably a best like like have that sort of conversation rather than you telling the coach that you're doing something wrong that that's not a, not a good way to go go about it so giving them that, that food for thought and going like yeah well this is what i've seen what do you think about this this option or and then having like the stats to back back you up have the video to back you up sort of like a number of uh different examples how you can put your point across um and it, rather than just being like a one-off thing that might have happened so having two, three, four clips of the same thing happening. You might only need to show one and you can go, I've got all these other clips if you want to see it, but here's the one clip. This is what I've seen. Um, what do you think? And then then you can sort of 
take it further up the chain um, as well. Because I, I guess I've seen um, an intern try and do something like that and just gone in and just been like, oh, this is what I think, thinking he knows like everything. Um, you know, maybe he did have a good point, but the way he went about it was not in the right way and it just instantly got dismissed. So I think if, if you can have those conversations with your other analysts, other coaches, and then sort of raise that as a, um, a potential workflow or something, then that's, that's a better way to go around it. Uh, spot on and, and yeah, kind of connecting those, those two, two different perspectives in terms of making sure you've got that evidence to, to back up and rationalize, but also um, potentially piloting or trialing and having those conversations with, with someone else. Um, whether that be those assistant on this or someone else in the department to, to get their views and um, before moving up that kind of um, potential hierarchy and, and structure within that club. So, no, brilliant. Um, and then just to, sorry. Sorry, just, John, can I just add to that? that yeah, the other thing as well I would think about was what, where I am, what's the environment you were in at the time when you, if you are going to challenge the coach, make sure that there's no one around you that, um, say like players or anything like that so you're going to challenge the message he's on um, so you, that's all well and good you can do that if you've got sort of like some sort of like long term relationship with that coach um, so there's that trust there um, to take that message on board but there's no point doing that having that, that conversation and some of them can get quite, um, quite tasty those conversations um, if you've got players around who can overhear it because then they, it almost gives them carte blanche then to start challenging that as well whenever they feel like it because you might have a heated conversation or you might have a, a debate with a coach about um, you know some sort of thinking that he's having um, but then you're going to walk out of that room and stick to the message that the coach is saying which might contradict what you're actually thinking so it sends out mixed messages so you've got to be really really wary about where you do that yeah, no, perfect, Lance, and yeah, making sure that there's that consistency across um, the, 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 the staff, um, not just the coaching staff, but all the analysis staff and, and the other members of support staff, so that's a consistent message and, and hopefully that importance of that multidisciplinary approach um, is more, more meaningful, so brilliant. Um, and then just one kind of final question um, before we open up the floor is, um, probably, probably to start, um, with, with Simo. So how can individuals um, further develop those communication skills that we've highlighted as being important and, and the ability to establish relationships and trust? How, how does someone actually go about developing those skills? Uh, I, I think we're all talking about analysis. I think the first thing, the first way of doing this is analyze yourself. I think at the moment in this environment, we all spend a lot of time uh, using video calls and this kind of um, technology. So if you're in a meeting with a, it doesn't matter who it is, why not re record yourself, watch it back? What are you good at? What are you not so good at? Body language for me plays a big part in it. It's very easy to see when people are, are engaged in what you're saying or doing or or when you're presenting if or talking, if you're nervous or you're not, you don't believe what you're saying. So I think one of the a good ways of improving your own communication skills is, is yeah, self-analysis basically. It's something we should all, all be doing. But but I've, one of the other areas I'm I'm very keen on is, as an analyst, you, it's vital to have good communication skills. But part of that is listening. And something really simple was you have two ears, one mouth. So you should really listen twice as much as you talk, especially when you're in a club or if you're in as an intern or you're just trying to gain an understanding of how they work, the listening component is as important, if not more important than the actual, the talking that you're doing. But, just, but when you are talking, just direct, impactful, engaging, but mo most importantly, just be respectful, respectful who you're talking to. It doesn't matter if you're talking to somebody senior, somebody more junior, just those communication skills will come in time. But self-analysis for me has, has taught a lot about what I am good and not so good at. And I'm, I'm well aware of them, all of those myself. Oh, perfect, thank you very much, Simone. And any, anyone else got any kind of um, key kind of 
methods or, or techniques that they've kind of used to, to develop those communication skills? I think at, at university, especially when you get given group tasks by tutors to do, that's a perfect opportunity to start um, building on some of the things that Simo was saying. And, and again, going back to being honest with yourself about, you know, if somebody points out a certain flaw, maybe um, in your communication skills, uh, don't take it too personally. You know, try and go away and, and like Simo says, work on that skill. But you can work on it in those 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 groups. Um, same with presentations as well. You know, so a lot of people get into the habit of reading from a, a sheet. You know, you know when they're giving a presentation back uh, to tutors, then it's it's not a good look um, to be doing that in that environment. So you need to you work on that a little bit. Um, but but yeah, certainly, you know, seek out people who are who you feel are good at certain skills as well, and uh, try and learn off them and get some pointers off them. Maybe if you're doing a feedback session, then maybe record yourself. We often recorded players in mock interviews and then play it back to them, so they can pick up the little bits and pieces in the interviews that might annoy them, but they don't really realise they're doing it. It's just a, a nervous trait that they have, and by seeing it again and again and again they can actually eliminate that from the way they um, deliver so so yeah so just being honest and, and like Simo says just um, recognizing the flaws in yourself but also your strengths as well yeah no that's that's a spot on kind of from, from Lance and uh, Simo in terms of those uh, important to kind of self-reflection and, and reviewing your own performance a lot of the time we get bogged down and reviewing those performances of, of others rather than our own self um, and one of the things that I kind of picked up from Lance is, is that almost in the innate uh, habit that you have as an individual um, potentially when you're communicating or delivering on a lecture and um, it's just important to kind of understand them and, and look at how you can uh, maybe overcome that or adjust some of the content or how you express those key messages so no really good um, and then just to kind of to, to finish the, the session, um, just kind of open up, up the floor really um, for any questions from, from the guys who are listening. Um, Jess has um, posted one in the, the chat panel already, which is probably more to, probably for Lance maybe to, to answer. Um, in terms of almost what does that kind of consultancy role look like? Um, and maybe in comparison to your, your typical day-to-day -day performance analyst? I would say one follows the other. So you've got to build up some type of uh, skill set early doors. So some of the uh, early skills that everyone's been talking about when you start as an intern. So you build that skill set up, build that trust up, and then start working with the team. And the way I got into the consultancy was basically just by word of mouth recommendations from within that team. So like if a touring team was coming over to the UK, for example, um, they would be looking at what resources are available to them in the UK and then they might get a recommendation of a, a player when they're in a representative camp with that player. They might say, well, you need to ring this guy up and you know, he'll be able to provide some bits and pieces of information. And then you go and meet, you know, go meet with the team and then obviously it builds from there. So you, there would be a consultancy element and then there would be a live element, you know, the embedded analyst element to it. But the, definitely the, the key skills, that you know, the, your foundation skills of an analyst come first and then build up your reputation and then you can move on to the consultancy. And then once you've got a bit of a reputation then within that, then you start getting more and more phone calls asking for information and that's when you become you know, somewhat unknowingly uh, a consultant. Um, and it was like a couple of years before I realized that that was even a tag that could be attached. Um, Cause I always saw myself as just as a performance analyst and that was it. Um, so yeah, so definitely build them skills first and then see where you want to go, which, which environment are you most comfortable in afterwards? Spot on. Yeah. And a really, really valuable insight Lance, and, and confirmation on those kind of two two roles um, how they're aligned but almost slightly different um, and that's probably um, from my kind of experience more so potentially with um, international teams who maybe not have as much funding um, and therefore won't have a full-time performance analyst 
uh, but might just need them to, to come in for, for camps or for feed up to a competition. So again, utilizing those networks um, that you may have or lecturers may have to, to see what opportunities um, might be. That's almost how I started in wheelchair basketball. Uh, it was just a, a cheeky email, knew they were in town uh, to see if I could get involved. So they were brilliant. Um, someone had a couple of kind of questions in terms of that, the integration and importance of the coach and the analyst relationship. Um, some, how, how important do you think it's um, for you to understand the coaching process, but also potentially to, to undertake coaching courses to develop that technical or tactical awareness? Probably, probably Ben or Andy um, for this one. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to lead uh, on this one, John. Um, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, like I'd, certainly, I'd certainly encourage people to do it if, they, if they've got an interest in, in the coaching side of things. Um, I think analysis and coaching work quite well together anyway. Um, but it's not essential. So um, by going through your coaching badges doesn't necessarily make you a good analyst. Um, what it will do is give you an understanding of how the coach may think, how they can approach... Um, things like planning for their training sessions or um, like what kind of formations they're likely to play in, in given scenarios. So it will certainly help with the, the understanding. Uh, and as we talked a lot uh, about today, once we've got an understanding of how a coach thinks and what kind of approach they're going to have, we can hopefully build that relationship and, and then embed ourselves in the, um, the analysis process. Um, so, so yeah, not, not essential, um, but it, but it would prove beneficial at QPR. We, we were all encouraged, all the support staff from analysts to medics, um, physios were all encouraged to do our, our coaching level two, which we did. Uh, some of us reluctantly, not me personally, but some, uh, some weren't too keen. Uh, and those who wanted to were encouraged to do their UA for Bs and their, their A's if that's the kind of avenue they wanted to go down. Um, it's not uncommon in particularly in academy football for analysts to also be the coach or assistant coach of like the under 16s or the under 12s, for example. Um, so the two complement each other quite well, um, but as I said, it doesn't, uh, it's not essential for being a good analyst, um, but for those who are interested, I'd, I'd encourage you to, to have a look at it at least. Spot on and, and kind of almost link into that from a, from a coach's perspective then. Um, Dan's kind of asked, what do those coaches almost need to potentially work on to, to aid us as analysts? Um, any kind of thoughts from, from the floor really on that one? Uh, I'll, I'll offer an initial response, John, before the others uh, jump in. But I think, um, uh, like some coaches will be quite reluctant to use analysis. Uh, in my experience, they're generally the uh, the more senior generations who haven't really haven't perhaps grown up with technology. They may be a little bit more resistant to to using it. Um, not always the case, but uh, certainly in my experience, uh, it would be helpful if the coach would be um, perhaps a like would give a little bit in terms of the methods you're trying to employ. Um, ultimately it comes down to, it comes down to the relationship and the environment, which we talked loads about today uh, and what's available. Um, yeah. I, I kind of, uh, I hand this over to see if the, the guys want to add anything on that, but, um, but yeah. So I'll just add one quick thing to that. I think it's really beneficial if the, the coaches, whoever they are, have an understanding as to what, what it is you do and how long potentially some of this stuff can take you to do. Um, I've experienced in the past and um, coaches making what I would deem as unreasonable requests, um, just expecting you to deliver something in two minutes that's going to take you way longer than two minutes to collate and pull together. So I, I think from a coach's point, just them having better understanding as to what the analyst role is and what you deliver but not only that how long some of this stuff can take to pull together it just enhances your offering because it doesn't overburden you or put unrealistic expectations on what you can turn around yeah, no, ma massive kind of that role clarity and role expectations um so one of the things we did at wheelchair basketball was that the, the strength and conditioner had to go and deliver a a performance analysis session, I had to go deliver an S&C session and we kind of rotated. So we got to experience what those environments were like and how they went about their processes. Um, but then that also gave us an insight into getting feedback on, on 
for ourselves and that being that self reflection. So, no good. Um, in terms of some of the other questions that are coming in, in terms of software and, and how can um, kind of develop those technical skills um, to enhance and ensure the, the information that we're collecting is, is informative, how's the best way to kind of them to develop and, and learn that? Um, is it through Huddle Academy or is it through any other kind of means? What's kind of best or recommended for you guys? Probably, yeah, for our software, Huddle Academy, definitely. That'd be number one stop I would I would look for. Um, talking to other analysts. Um, I noticed the question also says, any aside from Huddle or Sports Code, what other software should you look for? Um, I would look at anything to do with video production. So learning things like Final Cut is a, is a good way of developing your skills. Um, if you don't have Final Cut, then things like iMovie. Um, learn a little bit about, you know, maybe around the actual manipulating sound within video as well. So have a look at that. And, and then basically any type of design software as well. So if you get your hands on, um, it doesn't matter which package it is, which software package it is, but just something that's going to engage you in, in trying to create. So outside of things like Keynote and PowerPoint, you know, how can you create images for those, for those slides or even for, you know, I've used things like pixel meter pro for producing graphics for inside code windows, for example. Um, but I had to learn it from scratch and, you know, it's always good to actually step outside sometimes of the software and actually go and learn a new skill and, and think of how can you then bring that back into into your daily work. Um, and then there's other times when you might go away and just want to learn something just for the sake of getting your mind off of your job. Uh, but obviously, you just want to keep learning um, all the time new skills. So, so yeah, for our software, definitely Huddle Academy and then extension of that would be anything to do with design software and also filmmaking. Okay. Right, perfect, Lance. And probably two last questions and then we'll, we'll start wrapping it up um, then. Um, so, so Bradley is probably a question maybe for Andy to answer in terms of um, if kind of internships is, is the predominant way that the majority of you guys have got into your full-time jobs. Um, is that probably the only route or are there other ways that people can kind of get into a full-time job? I think that that's like a, it's a really good way to get yourself in with a team to learn sort of your trade because like there's obviously stuff that you guys do is, is great sort of in a university environment, but actually getting into the field and, seeing how analysis is created, delivered, fed back, and how, how that, how everything sort of implements within, within the, the, like the setup um, is, for me, I found it really beneficial doing um, an internship and working my way up. Um, I guess there are other ways to sort of get involved. So if you come from more of the coaching background, as like Ben said, with the, if you're a coach and you're sort of working with the academy guys and you sort of you get it, get into it from that side so um i think you could you could look at it that way because that was i guess one thing i'd considered before was was coaching and then you know maybe um if you don't if you're not playing at a high level coaching is quite a difficult thing to get into so analysis is another route into into the professional game um so i think yeah i think being able to sort of have I think it's a great way to, to get into it. Um, it's not limiting you to it. Um, that it's not saying that's the only way you can get into it, but predominantly a lot of people that I've spoken to now, because there's so much, I guess, competition for roles that um, people tend to do that, whether it's paid or unpaid, or you get sort of um, help towards your degree or your master's and, or something like that. So um, it's a great, great tool to get you into, into a club. Perfect. And, and then the last kind of question, um, in terms of a lot of the time where it's been historically seen as that the analysis um, works in a silo um, as the person who kind of collects this information for others to use. Um, and it's becoming over the last couple of years that it's a more of an interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary approach to, to problem solving. Um, and 
look searching for that solution. Um, have any of you guys um, got an example from from your from your previous experience of how you've worked collaboratively with others to to solve a potential problem? Um, yeah, so I um, I worked a lot with the, our GPS analysts and the, the data scientists and integrating um, the coaches were given like a stack of paper with all the, the GPS outputs and things like that. And again, like it's understanding what the coaches want. Like sometimes they need a lot of information like that, but it was trying to like get it to a, get it into a format that the coaches could see and have an output with it. So. I worked with one of the guys to sort of ingest um, the data into sports code, which could then be given to the coach um, and he could have his output window and he could be able to click on those clips and see, like visually see how, okay, if you're saying a, a player is going into like zone five and he's running X meters per second or something like that, it's, it's, does that mean a lot to a coach? Not always. If he can then see it, then it can make a, have a bigger impact. So there's a, there's a lot of stuff that you can do with those other departments, whether that's the medical team, looking at injury analysis and actually seeing that output of that as well, um, rather than just the data. So I think a lot of it brings the data and the video together is, is how I'd approach things like that. Yeah, no, and I've, I kind of conducted a multidisciplinary approach um, when within wheelchair basketball for classification. So how could we get a player who was, in the coach's view, overclassified and reduced down to a lower classification um, so that a better lineup or, or players on the basketball court could, could get on that court? So how we worked with the physios to medically screen that individual, how we collect her on-court on performance data to highlight how she wasn't using um, her left leg to support her. So then we brought in... Um, uh, pressure cushion seating company um, who then contoured her pushing mechanics around the court so then combining kind of report back to the classifiers for her then to, to reduce um, and enable her then to get into that starting five of a, of a lineup so no fantastic all right then guys um, no that's that's um, I think we'll, we'll pause there and um, if any of you've got any other any questions I know um, I think uh, some of the other members on the chat have been uh, answering questions um, whilst the main session has been delivering. If you've got any other further questions, then, then don't hesitate to get in, get in touch with us and, and we'd be more than happy to, to help. Um, what we'll probably try and do um, is, is, is we'll look at maybe another another webinar. If you keep your eyes out on, on Huddle, on, on Twitter and, and social media, and for any updates, uh, and that's probably the best platform to use. Um, myself and Andrew will probably be um, tweeting as well through our um, university accounts of any further updates in, in terms of the social media presence and, and future webinars. And um, what I want to say just before we kind of finish up is thank the, the, the guests on here today, um, and also thank Jamie and Kai for kind of putting this initial idea together. Um, as it's been really beneficial and insightful. So um, thank you for myself um, and thank you to, to the guys um, out there as well and hope you found value in today's session.